Hello, 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 and welcome to this month's amazing lineup on the Her Version Impact panel. Her Version launched in January of 2021 and had its first guest speaker in April of the same year. Since then, the Her Version platform has been expanding rapidly with over 370 YouTube videos, over 85 female guest speakers, and over 60 impact panel guests. As of the month, we are also streaming across 10 podcast platforms, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Pandora, to name a few. I am thrilled to have a female panel filled this month as we talk about the journey of being a single mom. Join us as we dive deep into our personal journeys and what we have created for ourselves in order to better our lives. For those of you that don't know me, I am your host, Sabrina Victoria. If you are new to this podcast, make sure you follow, like, subscribe, and share. Let's jump right in. I want to touch on one thing um, because it was mentioned just within comics comments within the female community as to a topic, you know, topics to cover. And and I think that the one that I want to bring up, we, we've we've talked plenty, and I wanted to make sure that we had enough time for all of us to speak. But since <clears throat> we still have a little bit more time here, I, I think that it's important for us to talk about mom guilt. Um, that was one of the things that that really popped up in accordance with being a single mom. And being guilty about not being there enough, being guilty about not having a spouse, whatever it is, I'd kind of like to maybe open the floor to you guys to talk about your version of what that was, or if you had it at all, and how you've overcome it, your view, your view on it, if anyone wants to, to share anything on that. I'll go. Go ahead. Okay. I'll go. So the topic is as a single parent dealing with the mom guilt, as in we don't have enough time to do everything or what I've always said was if they succeed, that was all me. If they fail, that was all me. So that's really where the mom guilt comes in is you have this weight of how they turn out is all on me. When you have two parents, it's easier to say, well, they get that from you. This is what you did. You know, you disciplined like this. And I do remember. So my my one of my questions, my second question was um, or, or even just a sharing for everybody is, you know, what what was a moment that you remember? You just sort of the the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. And this goes along with the guilt. And I remember my children were all sick. I had a girl in each bathroom vomiting and I had the baby in the crib vomiting and I'm running and they're calling me. And my oldest daughter was sort of the exorcist when she threw up. Um, so, you know, she would do the whole thing, you know, and, and, and I'm running from bathroom, you know, bathroom to bathroom to baby. And at one point I stopped in the hallway and I lost my shit. I, I, if, if there was a video camera, CPS would have been at my door. Cause I was just like, Whoa! you know, you, you reach a point where you yeah. just, there's one of me and three of you. Yeah. I, I can't do this right now. So the mom guild, what I always reminded myself through everything, even if I failed, even if I made mistakes, the best thing to say to yourself is no one is going to love them the way I do regardless yeah. of how I fail, regardless of mistakes or lessons or anything. That's what I just kept saying to myself was there's no one in on this earth that will ever love them as unconditionally as I do. And so no matter what I do wrong, that's the only thing that matters in the end. So dealing with the guilt, have more mercy on yourself. I think we're so hard on ourselves as women, as mothers, just, have some mercy and just say, Hey, you know what? I screwed that up. Let me not do that again. Let me just, you know, pivot over here and try something different. So that's my solution to guilt, to mommy guilt. Just tell yourself you're doing the best that you can. That's all you can do. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll go next. I go think, 
mom guild, I think it's been a few topics on my blog or my, you know, lots of things that I talk about, you know, social media wise, but mom guild, I think is huge. And I had a lot of it. I, I felt that I uh, took the family away from my children that Mm -hmm. initially I was, I felt very guilty that my children did not have the family that they had known. And so I think initially I really overcompensated for that and, you know, tried to still, you know, do all most of the things that we had done before um, and, and creating, you know, new things that were, you know, kind of like, oh, let's do this, let's do this. And, and it just, it wore me out. It wasn't sustainable in that way. And I think, you know, I felt so guilty about that, that it really pushed me to try to create this better and healthy co-parenting dynamic so that there was fluidity with the kids. But, um, you know, for me, what I ultimately came down to similar to what Maureen was saying is just showing up, being consistent. You know, I could be tired. I could be, you know, in the middle of coaching, whatever, but just, I'm at that game. I'm helping them with their homework. I'm present when I'm with them because that's what they remember. And I would sit and think, what do I remember as a child with my family? And, you know, when my parents, what made me feel loved with my family when I was a child, if I can remember back to that, what created that for me. And so that's where I I started to just really focus is exactly what you were saying, loving them, being present with them, you know, snuggling them, you know, doing our little movie nights and just the things that just made them feel loved instead of this vision that I was trying to still hold on to and create and, and hold on for them because, you know, I had to work through that. I had to work through, you know, I, and I wasn't the one that, that caused the, you know, the dynamic of the family or, or the divorce, but it just, it was collective. It was both of us, but I just carried that with me. So that's how I've worked through it. It's just, you know, loving them, showing up and being consistent. You know, if I set a rule or if I said something, follow through with it. If I say I'm going to be there or we're going to do this, we do it. You know, not, oh, well, I'll do it later. I'll do it later because that perpetuates the feeling of not being important and not feeling in loved. I think for, from a kid's perspective and, and from just reading different books and different stories about people. Um, so that's my, that's how I've kind of overcome that and just let myself be with them. 100%. 100%. Yeah, I, I love that what you, what both of you, all of you said, and we all go through the mom guilt and overcompensate and really what, yes, giving yourself grace and realizing you don't have to be mom and dad. You just have to be mom. And my mom taught me that. My mom taught me that uh, as growing up. I'd love to hear that that's a separate question, a bigger conversation, but just showing up, showing up, being there for them, doing what they like versus, well, this is what I want to do. What do you like? And allowing them to evolve uh, is such a beautiful thing to watch your children grow and, ex- and having experiences through their eyes and getting to know their friends. Uh, I, I got really close to my kids' friends because I loved who they were and who they were with. And when you have that cohesiveness, things are just so much better because you're more involved in your life. They want you to be there. My kids always said, no, I want, I want you to come with us. My friends want to see you too. And what a great feeling. What a great feeling. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Um, It's interesting that you use the word uh, overcompensate. I think two of you guys said that overcompensate. And I'm going to quote Dr. Phil again. Well, not necessarily quote him, but um, something that I learned from him because I know I dealt with this. I didn't deal with this a whole lot when he was younger, but as he got older, um, I started, I think, to overcompensate because I wanted him to like love me more and to appreciate me more and to secretly, you know, I never, you know, I wasn't like, and I didn't bad talk his dad or anything like that. But secretly, I wanted him to like me more and to love me more. You know, I had gone through so much when he first left when he was a baby. And then his dad popped back in randomly when he was like three or four. And all of a sudden, he was loving his dad. And I was like, wait a minute here. 
how how could you be showing this man any sort of appreciation when I've just sacrificed so much for you? But he's like three, you know? So um, Dr. Phil says an interesting thing as far as uh, parenting from guilt and overcompensating. Mm-hmm. And he says something to the effect of not quoting you, Dr. Phil, sorry, exactly. But who are you doing it for? Mm-hmm. So are you doing it in a greedy, egotistical way of me, 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 and I want to look good, and I, which is what I was doing. I want to be the best one. I want to be the good one. Mm-hmm. I want to have all the love I want. Or are you parenting for the child? and what's in the best interest of the child. And I remember when I heard that, which was fairly early on at this point in my life, I changed, you know, I, I altered it a lot. And I, I had to really do some self-reflection on, wait a minute, you know, this is actually coming from a, a not good place in, inside of me, me letting him get away with things, me not feeling comfortable disciplining him the same way because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I didn't want him to think dad was more... You know, because when he would visit dad, dad was fun. So like they'd go to a hockey game or they'd go to like, uh, you know, whatever it was. And I'm over here like, do your homework or whatever. You know, it's just like I'm I feel like the crappy militant mom who has all the rules and makes him make his bed. And then his dad is like super fun and awesome. And I hated that. I like secretly super regret like re- res. What's that word? Re- Resented. 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 Resented him for that. So in order to like gain some of that back, I, I was not being as harsh or not that I was like a harsh mom, but you know, like being more lackadaisical with rules and all of that stuff. And I really had to sit back and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I have to be careful here. I have to be careful with making sure that I'm still implementing the correct things that my child needs in order to develop mentally and emotionally correctly. Um, And I have to put all this ego stuff aside. You know, I'm not the super fun, awesome mom all the time, seven days a week, or what would that be? That would be like 16 days in a row. Am I a really awesome, cool, fun mom does really fun things sometimes? Yeah, but not all the time because there's shit to do. So, so like, so you know what I mean? So I really had to self-reflect. So for those of you listening, we still have a ton of people hanging out here. We've almost been on here for two hours. I so appreciate you guys being here, supporting us, listening in. Um, If this is an area in which you are suffering, which I did really a lot, this, this was a big thing for me. Uh, It's important to recognize, you know, where that's coming from as far as, um, mom guilt and parenting from guilt. I want to, I want to piggyback off of, oh, um, why are you so, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, what you were saying, Sabrina, I'll just make one brief comment, Maureen, and then you can go, um, uh, talking about, uh, parenting from, um, you know, what you're teaching your child, right? Mm-hmm. This is, this is huge. And this is where I've started to really implement communication skills with my children. So for instance, with you saying, um, uh, you know, I'm the stickler, I'm getting this done. You're, you know, you're doing your homework. I'll just give you an example. Same thing that I go through right now, because my kids are 10 and 12. Yes. So I say, you know, it may not be fun to do your homework right now, but my job as a parent is to help you grow your brain, to help you, you know, gain these skills so that you can continue through school and so that you you are creative and you're supportive and you start to figure out the things that you really love. So I take these opportunities and I communicate it with them. If I get frustrated, if I've had enough and I'm like, guys, how much has I have I done for all of us today? What have you contributed? Why do you think I'm at my max right now? Why do you think you should, you know, I'm, I'm hitting this wall right now because I've asked you eight times. I shouldn't have to do that. Like there's, there's a responsibility. You're a part of this family. You're a part of this household. We all collectively need to work together. And I don't think this is language, you know, just for single parents. I think this is just parenting in general. Yeah. We, we tend to, you know, try to make everything perfect for our kids. And it's like, 
that doesn't help them or give them skills for life. And so I think also back to your very first question, Maureen, you know, what's the, the big advantage? I think we kind of touched on it is take that opportunity to just communicate and teach them skills through these lessons and not just get angry or not just be that militant, you know, mom to say, you have to do your homework, you know, let them know why. And even if you have to say that eight times over the course of a week, it will, it will stick with them. Then they understand. So when I get upset or when I've hit my max and, and they're like, they're not like, Oh, you know, we don't like seeing mom like this. No, they know. Okay. Mom's had enough. You know, I've heard my younger, my older son telling my younger son, you've got to do this. Do you know how tired mom is right now? Do you know what she's doing? You know, they have their their own dialogue together, you know, in their room. And I'm like, I created that because I created the opportunity to communicate and I am growing little gentlemen. That's my goal. So yes, yes. So I had to hop in on that is just take it as opportunities to really teach and communicate so that we can break that cycle of non communication skills in adults. That's, that is amazing. I love that. And you can see the fruits of your labor when you're not around. And, and, you know, we always want to see it in front of us, good manner, speak well, but when you, when you sneak up and you hear it, you know, from behind the scenes, it's super cool. I wanted to piggyback off of the overcompensating because one, two, three of you said overcompensating. Mm -hmm. And what popped into my head is to not do what I did and the overcompensating became enabling. Yes, yes, exactly. I enabled my oldest daughter for years. I mean, she's 32 now. And I think up until six months ago, I was still enabling. I didn't want to see her again. I wanted to see the potential. I didn't want to see exactly who she is and what choices she was making. Also, I was parenting from guilt. I was parenting from the idea that she has relationship problems and she's in abusive relationships because of me, because her father did this to me. I was her example, or I gave her a father that wasn't a good example of a man. And so I parented out of this guilt and not wanting her since I was all alone and had no support system from my family. I was like, I'm never going to let my child flounder Mm -hmm. out there alone. I'm going to put a pillow down every time she falls and she's never going to have to feel the pain of falling like I did. Unfortunately, it really inhibited her growth. And now at 32, there's still not enough growth there. There isn't any independence and there's, uh, I'm seeing things for what it is. So the overcompensating, like you said, Sabrina, you know, I want to be the nice guy sometimes too. Why do I always have to be the bad cop? (laughs) You know, (laughs) why why do I have to make you do all that unfun stuff? But it can really, in my case, you know, I I carried it so far um, to the overcompensation, to the enabling that you're actually creating you're stunting their growth and i you know and then you have guilt over that too so i mean it (laughs) it doesn't matter whether they're 3 13 or 32 there's always something you feel guilty about but what i've learned now by understanding like you said it's okay they're going to love me for what i what they've seen me do as a parent and guided them in the best way i knew how and and the how about the consistency how about the stability that I provided? That's going to speak larger volumes than a trip to Disneyland on the yeah. weekend. I'm going to tell yeah. you that. And long term, when I hear my adult children say, I remember when you took us to the park after dinner every night. Well, yeah, because I didn't have a dime to rub together. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. all we could do was go to the park. I couldn't afford to take you to the movies. Or, But it's interesting what they do remember versus your guilt over having to make this big, you know, beautiful, love, wonderful childhood that's extravagant. That's not it. And the problem is, is when they see their friends, there's that competition. If they have the friends that are in the two parent household, it's hard to compete when you're a single mom. And so you do the best you can by creating something that's fun, 
without having to compete with the big grand gestures and the, the expensive vacations and toys and, and things. And you say, what you have is more valuable. You have a mom who gives you all of her love and attention versus things. Your things are going to wear out and they're going to go to the landfill. My love will never wear out. Yeah. So. I so appreciate you being uh, open about that with your daughter because that's that I, I appreciate you um, voicing that. And it kind of gave me a little more, um, a little more, I guess, happiness towards the way that I'm, it, it's hard to do it the other way. Um, you know, having my son do, do difficult things because I don't want to see him struggling or hurt or irritated or frustrated with me. But the, the situation that he went through with his dad and um, him needing to create his own boundaries, you know, I really took, it was really hard for me not to step in as like mom and, and do the phone call and be like, hey, listen, this is the new rules that my, you know, like the middleman. And I had to step, I had totally stepped back. He's 17. And he voiced all the things. And it was probably a seven phone call drama filled stuff between him and his dad over the course of maybe two or three weeks. And I had to sit back and I had to support him. And I had to give him solid advice. And he, you know, he made the phone calls right in front of me with me in the room. And he did all of it. You know, I didn't. I had to keep my mouth closed and it was very uncomfortable for him. He got very emotional many times. His dad got very emotional many times, but my son was able to, you know, confidently speak. He was able to speak his mind. He was able to speak um, with emotion and as difficult as it was. And as much as he was like, I don't want to do this. This is so uncomfortable. You know, I can't believe why can't I just ignore you know, why can't I just avoid his phone calls? And I was like, that's not how we do things. You know, that's not, that's not how we communicate as humans. As humans, we have the ability to speak our mind with our words. And, you, and I told him, you have to do this now because there's something in your future that is going to need you to know how to do this later on. Yeah, I told him that. Yeah. And I said, I said, this is your practice. You are practice. Your dad is giving you a gift of being able to practice this right now because you're going to need to do it again at some point. So he understood that. It still did not make it any easier. Still did yeah. not appreciate it. But I'm telling you that the amount of confidence when you make your children do hard things. When you make your, like, like Leanne was saying, when you make your children do things that you wish your parents would have done for you, the confidence that they walk away with is out of this world. It's out of this world. And him being able to speak his mind, him being able to communicate thoroughly about what he needs, what he appreciates, what he doesn't appreciate, it's gotten, and it's always been, because this is stuff that I've been doing, you know, for years. But this was a big thing, a, a very big thing for him because this is his dad. Yeah. So I appreciate you saying that, Maureen, because as difficult as it is to watch it on this side and to want to be the coddler and the protector, you know, making those hard decisions and sitting by and watching your child upset, watching him cry, watching him with the with the emotions flowing through and not knowing what to do and not wanting to do it and whining it's, you know, I was emotional, yeah. but I, you know, and I am emotional, but I was emotional during this, but I had to restrain myself from enabling. And I'm so glad that I did. And I'm so appreciative to you sharing your story because the, this is the conversation that creates, you know, the education and the inspiration for other women out there to see like, Hey, yeah, it's going to suck. However, this is the dynamic of which I can choose which one, you know? And I learned the difference from my oldest to my son. And with my son, he was able to speak his mind and say to me, mom, you need to let me make mistakes. Quit trying to fix everything for me. That. And yeah. I had to step back 
you know, like your, your son's age, because it was just him and I in the house. And I learned instead of fixing it for him, plus yeah. he also, you know, was diagnosed with ADHD and you feel they already have a deficit and your instinct as a mom, like you said, as hard as it was to watch that, you yeah. want to just say, no, yeah. no, do this to my baby. Yeah. But what I learned with my son from actually watching a girlfriend of mine that had four boys, because I had only had girls, was I learned to stop, take the pause, step back and go, oh, buddy, what do you think the best answer to that would be? Love it. Instead of jumping in and being like, let me fix this for you. Well, like I, I did it. with my sister. It was yeah. always fix it, fix it, fix it for them. And I learned I'm not going to do this um, again. And learning to take that step back, you have to take the pause because your mother instinct is to step in and protect and love and nurture and and cushion and you gotta like Elian said and and you Sabrina you the hard things the hard thing is to say no and they always say that the hardest thing as a parent is to say no the yes is the easy thing so being able to say to my son how are you gonna do that what do you think is the best solution for that oh That's buddy awesome. that must really suck you know but I stopped awesome. saying let me call that person yeah. let me call your manager let me fix this for you. Let's go down here and take care of this. And now he's this super responsible general manager of a company at 23 years old. I and so it does work, you guys, as hard as it is to all of you out there. You know, you'll, you'll see this, especially the teenage years. I mean, I'm starting all over with this 14 year old grandson. Those teenage years are crucial. And you're in the preteens, Leanne, with the 10 and 12 this is the time this is yeah. the time you guys to insert those those solution minded mm -hmm. mindsets for I those kids that. right 100 yeah yeah that um, is so much i i love that and what i've learned i want to add to that as they get older i've learned a really good lesson because we're always looking to fix or provide a solution and also because we're all coaches and we we all we we have all this experience now i'm learning to say are you just venting or do you want a Perhaps. suggestion or solution and i've learned to ask that that's right. great and otherwise we just tend to just jump in there and that really helped and i've gotten an answer no i just really wanted to vent i had no one else to say this to thank you mom Love My it. grandson wow. calls it the five C's. And he says to me, Grandma, you talk too much. And sometimes you just start life coaching. And I'm like, oh, sorry, let me take off the life coach hat and put the grandma hat on. And the five C's are conversation, comfort, and um, what's the third one? Uh, it's the, what is it? Conversation, comfort. Aiden, yeah. help me. Com Care. Com um, communication. 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 Conclusion. 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 So it's that same thing. The conversation is, I just want to vent. The comfort is just have sympathy and an empathetic ear for me. Grandma, hug me, give me a hug. And then the conclusion is I need some solutions. And so it's so funny that you just said that because he taught me that. And wow. We should do yeah. that in every conversation, whether it's family relationships or our children. What do you need? And yeah. here's what I need. Wouldn't, wouldn't we be a better world wow. if we all asked that of someone else said, this is what mm -hmm. I need. What is it that you need? We would never have unmet needs and everyone would be in my world, my Pollyanna, perfect <laughs> world peace world. <laughs> it's so right. How can I help versus jumping in there? Yeah. How can I help you right now is That's another great. great question. Because, and, and I, like my, then my daughter would say, you know, mom, you did help by just listening to me because I already figured out what I want to do. I've got this. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. That's yeah. great. That's and great. The greatest feeling of a mother. A hundred percent. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. I so appreciate uh, the three of you hanging out with me this morning. For those of you listening live, we so appreciate you being here supporting us.